Thank you. Alrighty. Okay, well, I'm glad everybody's here. It's it's neat to get some people from around the world, and I appreciate your questions. I had a couple questions already on the forum, so feel free to ask those. Um, so about five years ago, I worked on a, a project that was a 12-channel a Ethernet-controlled battery charger. It was about 160 watts per channel, and it would also discharge the batteries at about 30 watts per channel, which is completely going into heat. It didn't we didn't have anything else to do with that power. So we had 30 watts of heat on each one of these battery chargers. And if you put that times 12, we had 360 watts of heat on each one of these chassis uh, chargers that we had. I was sure we were gonna need some sort of serious heat sinks and fans for that kind of power. But my mechanical engineer assured me we could heat sink to the chassis and it was gonna be no problem. Well, <laughs> that was not true. He unfortunately did not do his homework. The first prototype heated, uh, overheated really badly, and we had to put a whole lot of more fans and a whole lot of more studies. We ended up delaying the project by, I think, a month or two. So this kind of class is designed for, for all of you people who are facing similar situations so that you don't have to go through the pain that I went through. This is just kind of a nice little screenshot of a thermal image uh, of a PCB. You can see the, the dye inside the ICs. It's really neat. You can see the hot spots on the board. Very handy. You can see these resistors are uh, running much hotter than the rest of the board. Uh, in my full day class, I go over tools and uh, the infrared, the imager is really a great tool to have to use. It's very handy. As, as Lucy mentioned, this class is a greatly shortened version of my half day class that will be in January. All right, so real quick, I'm gonna go over the outline. Why do we care about temperature? We're gonna talk about physics. We're gonna talk about semiconductor cons uh, construction and heat. And then we're gonna talk about how we can spread that heat out using PCB techniques in uh, surface mount specifically. Then we're gonna go over a few practical thermal guidelines. It's a popular notion that for every 10 degrees C temperature rise, semiconductors wear out twice as fast. I don't know how many of you have heard that. This is based on the Arrhenius Henius equation. I don't know how to pronounce that. Which is to describe chemical reactions. And uh, basically, it's true. We can't say absolutely that this is always going to be true for every device, because of course, there are multiple of different kinds of failures. Some failures will be uh, in packaging, some failures will be in on the silicon. We can always say that cooler electronics will last much longer on average. Clearly, this LDO will not last too long. Uh, whoops, wrong one. Okay, so um, the mean time between failure is proportional to E C over T. So where T is the operating temperature of the system in Kelvin, and C is the specific uh, system specific constant that you can calculate. There's a number of good equations on the military sites specifically about reliability. They talk about uh, lots of different components and how they work together. They also talk about this equation. As temperature decreases, of course, reliability will increase. The benefits to lower temperatures are things like less temperature cycling, and of course, that means less mechanical stress because as your devices heat up, they will expand. As your PCB heats up, it will expand. And every time you turn it off and it cools down, it will contract. So over time, you'll get separation of things that have high differences in their expansion and contraction rates. And that's one reliability problem. Of course, we all know that the system will operate in uh, higher ambient temperatures. If it runs lower as uh, an operating temperature, you'll have much better reliability. But the overall goal is that your junction temperature, meaning the temperature inside this device, this is a, an LDO, the temperature inside here, the junction temperature on the silicon should remain lower than the maximum data sheet. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse here, but I'm pointing at this overheating device. Yes, we can. Okay, good. 
All right, before we talk about how to get rid of the heat, let me briefly touch on the best solution to thermal management. Design matters, cost versus efficiency. There's probably a more expensive way to do what you do that's more efficient. But maybe you haven't considered that because it's too expensive. But when you look into thermal management, you realize that it is not cheap. It's actually fairly expensive to put a fan in your system, to put a big heat sink in your system. So think about ways to stop making heat in the first place. And this is kind of a funny, funny way to look at thermal management, but it would be best if you didn't have to manage anything, right? Heat related. It would be best if you didn't make that heat in the first place. So think about uh, cost versus efficiency trade-off. Power supplies, for example. LDOs are great, they're cheap, they're quiet, but are they the best solution for your system? A buck or a, a, a switching regulator is gonna be more money, but it also be more efficient. So you may be able to avoid some heat management by spending a little more money up front, and you may end up with a cheaper solution overall. MOSFETs are a great example too. You can spend a little more money and you can lower your resistance and that will reduce the amount of heat that you have to take away. Inductors, the same way, spend a little more money, make a little less heat. AC power handling can be similar. All the above can reduce the heat. So you may end up not having to put a fan in your system. You may end up not having to put uh, heat sinks. So that would, that would save you a lot of money overall. So I just wanted to bring that up quickly because it's worth thinking about. So um, let's go to the basics, physics. Uh, I know you guys all remember this from high school. <laughs> in this case, the heat in has to equal the heat out. Otherwise, your temperature is going to go higher and higher and higher until the heat in does equal the heat out or until it bursts into flames. <laughs> None of us want that. So barring some conversion of heat into uh, some other type of energy, there's got to be an equilibrium. Now I'm talking about heat power. I'm not talking about electrical power. So for example, if you've got a power supply that's 400 watts, that's not 400 watts of heat. That's 400 watts of power. The actual heat would be 400 watts times the inefficiency of the regulator of the power supply. So let's say you've got a 90% um, efficient regulator that would be 40 watts of heat you would have to handle because 10% of that 90% is inefficiency, which is gonna equal heat. If your processor is generating five watts of heat, it's got to dissipate five watts of heat out regardless of the ambient temperature and environment. So the ultimate goal of thermal management is for electronics to transfer all the heat in the air. And it's kind of funny to think about, all the heat has to go in the air. No matter what happens, it can go in the chassis, it can go into the case, all the heat has to go into the air at some point. So the key is how do we get a large enough area to conduct this heat into the air with the airflow that we have? Now, this is of course not true if you're doing some sort of underwater thing, but in general, heat in has to equal heat out in air. Methods of heat transfer. Uh, I think you guys probably all remember this from middle school, <laughs> uh, conduction. And that's basically how uh, the spoon is conducting heat from the hot coffee or hot water, hot tea, up through the handle. That's conduction through the material. Heat is conducted inside the part package and inside the PCB, like heat is conducted inside a copper bar. If you heat up one end, the heat moves along the bar to the other end. Conduction heat transfer is easily calculated and very predictable. Radiation. You guys have all maybe sat in front of a fireplace. You feel that heat being radiated, and that's awesome. It's, it's a great form of getting rid of the heat. It will go into the air or something eventually, but it's being radiated off your board. This is how the sun heats the earth. Radiation is a small part of most electronics cooling, unfortunately. And that's because radiation really works best if you've got you know, something that's glowing, 
<laughs> so let's hope your electronics don't do that. Radiation heat loss is also not difficult to calculate. And the last one is convection. Convection is heat moving into the air by some convection due to the flow of that medium. So if a fan is cooling a PC, the air gets heated mostly by the convection of the air over the heat sink. Convection uses conduction in that heat is transferred as one substance, say a heat sink fin, is in contact with another. However, the air constantly refreshes itself and therefore maintains a near constant temperature at the heat sink ideally. And of course, this isn't true if you're in some sort of enclosed case like a like a, a rack mount chassis that has a door. So keep that in mind. This movement is affected by so many things it's impossible to calculate perfectly because air movement is somewhat random. Not even the best software tools can completely predict that. There's turbulence. There's uh, also lots of other ways. So force convection describes fan airflow just for future reference. When, when they talk about heat sinks, there will be a curve for natural convection and a curve for forced convection. And that describes fan airflow at a certain LPM or linear uh, LFM, linear feet per minute. Natural convection happens, of course, because air becomes lighter when heated. Now, this is not true in space. So if any of you have space issues, you know, where there's no gravity, that's a different ballgame. But probably most of us work on Earth. At one point, my wife had uh, what they called gestational diabetes during her pregnancy with my uh, last son. And I joked to the di dietitian that I wanted to eat a whole bag of Oreos <laughs> and laughed at the massive amount of carbohydrates that would be. The dietitian said something that surprised me. She said, it's not about carbohydrates. It's about how fast you eat them. In other words, eating a bag of Oreos all at once is clearly a bad thing if you're diabetic or really at any point. <laughs> Eating a bag of Oreos little by little over a month is completely fine. Heat is really the same way. It's not about how much heat you have. It's about how much heat per unit area you have. So the temperature of electronics reaches uh, is directly related to its wattage and its area. This is really an important part of thermal management. So let's say we have five watts of heat dissipation. Again, not five watts of power, but five watts of heat dissipation going through our system. And it's spread over a four by three inch PCB. It will result in about a 15 degrees C rise. Now, on the other hand, the five watts of heat in a three by three millimeter MOSFET will result in several hundred degrees Celsius rise. And obviously you need to spread that heat out. So it's not just wattage, but how much wattage per unit area is being dissipated. Degrees C rise is directly related to heat area, although not exactly linear. Uh, radiation and conduction are directly proportional to the area, but convection is more complicated, as we talked about, because it, it has to do with airflow, and it often results in nonlinear um, proportionalities. So cho choosing larger parts, assuming no other design changes, will reduce temps a lot. And I have seen this directly. For example, an 0603 resistor uh, will be much worse than a 1206 resistor. And we can see that because an 0603 resistor is usually rated at, at much less wattage than a 1206 resistor. but did you know that the wattage that any resistor is rated at will depend directly on the pads and the copper area surrounding that part? So the fine print, especially on power resistors, I go over this in my uh, full in my half day class on heat in January. If you're doing any like power resistor stuff with uh, 10 watt, 30 watt, 100 watt resistors, 
they have to be rated, they have to be put on some larger area of copper or aluminum, spread out the heat. If you just put them in the air, they will burn up long before they ever reach their rated wattage. A three by three mil millimeter FET is definitely worse than a larger one. And of course, five by five is also worse than a TO220 FET. Spreading hot par parts evenly through a PCB is also good because you may end up with lots of hot spots on the PCB, but your, your, your heat is gonna be spread more evenly through the PCB. Now, I'm sure that most of you know, that's not how most people do it. And I understand, you know, generally you gather your MOSFETs in one area, but usually it's to be put on some sort of aluminum bar that goes to a case or goes to a heat sink. So that's fine. But if you're gonna do SMB MOSFETs, for example, it's really good to be able to spread that heat out as much as possible throughout the PCB, especially if you can use copper that is, uh, that is thicker, like two ounce copper. I'll talk about that a little bit. Putting hot parts in the corner of the PCB is not a, because the heat cannot spread past the, the, uh, the edges of the PCB. So really, uh, since we are designing the system from a heat perspective first, or at least understanding this heat perspective first, uh, we can choose larger components and spread the heat out if possible. And this is exactly what I was talking about before, where I was saying, um, if you can choose larger MOSFETs, you might spend a little more money. But think about this. It doesn't have to be a larger MOSFET. You could actually use the same MOSFET twice. You could use two MOSFETs to handle the same load. And while it's not necessary from a power perspective, you'll be able to spread the heat out a lot. And you may be able to avoid some expensive things like really nice heat sinks. So that's a good example of uh, spending a little more money up front and saving money as a system. <laughs> I don't know why this didn't come out in my other slide. This PowerPoint's being weird. But anyway, to beat a dead horse <laughs> one more time, spreading the heat out allows for more area, radiation, conduction, convention, convection, larger areas, Spreading of energy equals lower concentration of energy in any one heat area. This is really the biggest part of thermal management. Radiation and conduction are proportional to the area. So two times more area is gonna mean two times more transfer. And that's a good thing. Now convection is a little more complicated. So it may not be quite two times less uh, temperature rise, but it'll be somewhat close to that. The real key to thermal management is spread out the heat. I can't say that enough. I hope if you take one thing away from this, this little thing here is to spread out the heat. One, this is the key to all thermal management, no matter what you're doing. It, con if it concentrates on one thing, spreading out the heat. Larger FETs, two ounce copper, thicker ground planes, thermal vias, all those things really concentrate on spreading out the heat. We want to avoid thermal energy concentration. For example, uh, one time on one of my boards, I had a, uh, a need for a diode. And so <laughs> being a prototype board, I just put in a 1N914 diode in there and it was fine, but you know, it's a really tiny diode. And it was handling less than the power it was rated for, but enough power was, when I touched it, it was pretty dang hot. So just know that we want to avoid thermal energy concentration. And actually, the move to surface mount has made this a lot easier because we can spread out the, hopper, the, the heat so much better now with copper than we used to be able to with uh, leaded parts. So assuming you've done your best to minimize the heat, spreading it out is really all you can do. Um, okay, so let's see, round 14, all right. So let's look at this electrically. And I know all of you electrical engineers, if you're, if you're an electrical engineer, or even if you're not, 
sometimes you think about things in terms of electrical circuits. Well, here's, a, here's an equivalent. You've got a heat source and you've got this resistance. In this case, we'll call it a thermal resistance because that's what it is. And then you've got this air. So like I said, all heat has to go to the air. How much resistance this is, is uh, going to be directly related to your system. So assuming a constant level of power needs to be transferred, excuse me, more, more resistance is going to be what? Of course, more or less. Thermally, if you have, say, 50, 50 watts here, let's just say you have 10 watts. If you have 10 watts as your heat source and your resistance is twice as much, your heat source is going to be two times more hot. You've got to get that air, that, that heat, from the heat source to the air. So I think that, that kind of makes sense. If you have any questions, you know, feel free to put them in the webinar chat, and I'll uh, address those as they come up. So here's an experiment I did. Uh, this was a, a simulation experiment. And these are neat things you can do to estimate how much heat you're going to have. I took an old junk PCB, and I glued a resistor to it. Uh, and I didn't have any traces to go to the resistors, so I used these 30 gauge blue wire essentially and went to the resistors. So you can clearly see that the heat is being transferred over these, these wires just as it would be uh, in a copper trace. So that's why, they, that's why I said earlier the heat you have in a resistor depends largely on the amount of copper, the width of the copper trace to the resistor. So anyway, uh, going back to this experiment, I put 100 milliwatts of heat in an 0805 resistor mounted on a six layer PCB. This is roughly a really tiny 55 uh, thousandths, 55 thousandths of an inch, ignoring the box side area for this time. We get an 18 degree C temperature rise on an 085 resistor. Now, if I have a 1206 resistor mounted on the exact same PCB with the exact same wires, you basically get twice the area, 95 thousandths. Um, but now your temperature rise is mm, close to half. I mean, it's not quite as, as good as that, but it's, it's a lot less. Small sizes are often closer proportional linear temperature rise over area. So that's just something to know. So this is an example. And uh, I, I shot this image with uh, our TI-27, our Fluke IR infrared imager. Fantastic tool to have. And I would highly recommend buying one. They're, uh, they're still not cheap, but they are worth it in the long run if you have any heat management issues. There are some caveats to using them, though, which I'll go over in my half-day class on heat in January. Heat is also proportional to temperature rise. So this is kind of the inverse of that. This is the good news. Heat and degrees of temperature rise are easily estimated with simple math. Uh, two times the heat will roughly equal two times the temperature rise. If one watt of heat equals 15 degrees C rise in your system, two watts of heat will be pretty close to 30 degrees C rise. Uh, the good news is it'll be a little less than that usually. There is some temperature reduction at higher heat input because things much hotter than ambient temperatures cool down faster due to the higher convection currents. And not that any of you will be caring about this, but things that are very, very hot cool very fast. And that's a good thing, <laughs> but not so relevant to electronics. Heat management for SMD. Um, so here's again a typical SMD MOSFET, or you could say it's an LDO. Let's talk about how we can spread out this heat. First of all, let's see, I'm trying to see here if I have a slide on semiconductor construction or if this is it. Looks like this is it. So let's talk about the die. Uh, here's the die. It's mounted on some sort of big copper pad, and it's also got wiring to another copper pad. And you know maybe if it's an LDO, it has several of these big pads for wires, and you connect them to the PCB. So 
the junction is going to be on the surface of this die. It's going to be on the top side usually, and it's going to have these bond wires going to it for electrical connections. So the heat is designed to flow through conduction uh, through the silicon die, which is pretty nicely conductive, and through this big copper pad right here, which is also very conductive. So that's really great for getting the heat out. That's how they design it. Now notice that people don't put heat sinks on top of MOSFETs like they do on top of processors. Why is that? Because on a MOSFET, the heat is always designed to flow into the circuit board. That's how surface mount MOSFETs are designed. Now, if this was a processor, it would be similar, only this big pad would be lots of little connections, and there would be a heat slug here that brought the heat to the top of the package. In fact, some processes, you, you can actually see the metal coming up through the plastic, but most of them have the heat slug pretty top, pretty close to the top of the plastic, and that's why uh, a heat sink mounted on top of a processor works. But like I said, on SMD MOSFETs, that's not true. And SMD LDOs are the same. So the heat sink is not going to be effective if you put it on top of this MOSFET or LDO because it's not designed for the heat to go that way. So what can we do about this? How can we spread out the heat? We can spread it out. Um, so how we can do that is a number of ways. Number one, and this is a uh, simplification again, but number one, we can have as thick a copper here as we can possibly get. And that means like uh, a large area, like for example, if you can get, you know, copper half an inch all the way around this MOSFET, then that's great because it's gonna conduct. And the, this copper on the PCB, even if it's under a solder mask is going to be a pretty nice heat sink. Now, if this is thicker copper, it's even better. If it's like two ounce copper, that's fantastic. Two ounce copper is great for spreading heat out. And uh, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more here. Yeah. Uh, now these thermal vias are also excellent and it's even better if they can connect to a ground plane or a power plane, because that will spread out the heat inside the board which will do a good job of getting it to the ends, uh, to the outside of the board. If you can spread it to a big copper area on the other side of the board, that's fantastic as well, because that'll be a great heat sink area. And if you have to, you can even put a heat sink on the other side of the board, which with this thermal interface material here to be electrically insulative, or there are some heat sinks you can solder that go on either side of the MOSFET, that solder on the regular pick and place machine will actually put on there. And they're fantastic because they have a great thermal connection to the MOSFET and therefore they spread the heat very well. So those are ways you can spread things out um, around a MOSFET on a PCB that work very well. So as I mentioned, um, thick copper is fantastic for spreading heat. The thing you have to worry about, though, is that you have an etched undercut. One ounce and larger often requires larger space and trace sizes, um, which means sometimes you're going to have to have a special board for your power. Um, sometimes the price increase for two ounce inner layers due to core costs. Uh, but again, you, spread, you spend a little more money up front you can actually save yourself money later on, depending on your system. You can get up to four ounce copper, but dang, you know, <laughs> the traces you have to do for four ounce copper are pretty large. Uh, you, I've seen manufacturers claiming 120 ounces, which is basically a solid copper slab. <laughs> it's ridiculously expensive. But two ounce copper is usually really easy and nearly free and you can get down to five mil space and trace, uh, and it may cost you a little extra because they have to inspect that area, but uh, you can get sometimes right around a TQFP that might need smaller, um, smaller 
uh, tray sizes. Sometimes you can get kind of an exemption for one small area of a PCB. And in general, if you have two ounce copper on the top, you're going to want to have two ounce copper on the bottom to make sure you don't end up with warping. But it will be twice as good as one ounce copper. So it is definitely worth it. You want to spread that heat out as much as possible because that is the name of the game. Okay, so let's talk about practical thermal guidelines. This is really my last slide, and then we're going to go into some questions. Um, approaches to thermal management. So it would be better, as I mentioned, not to generate heat in the first place, which may cost you up front, but it will be worth it. For example, a buck switcher. Now, I could talk about LDOs. I can bring up a slide on that. Uh, you want to get as much copper around those LDOs as possible. And I would say the same thing for um, diodes. You uh, LEDs, specifically power LEDs. You want to get as much copper around those as possible. Uh, otherwise, they will not handle their rated power. If you see an LDO that's rated 100 milliamps, and it's roughly like a 4 by 4 millimeter package, uh, it will not do 100 milliamps. If your, temp if your voltage drop is large, unless you put some serious copper around it. So be aware of that. More efficient MOSFETs will cost you more money, but again, you'll save money in the long run. N-channel is generally lower resistance than P-channel, so can you switch ground instead of power? That's one way to do that. So N-channel will actually be cheaper for a lower resistance FET than a P-channel. So not only can you get lower resistance, but you may end up with an actual cheaper system, which is a, a double bonus. Or can you do a completely different approach to your problem? I don't know. If you do have to generate heat, address it first if you can. Now I would say mechanical design, you know, we all have our mechanical people unless we are the mechanical people on our project. So talk to them up front about problems that you think will happen um, because it's going to affect them. Now, it depends company by company how who's really responsible for that heat. But I can guarantee you that if you work with your mechanical engineer or whoever is doing your mechanical design, they're going to be much happier if you bring it up before you do the design than after. <laughs> because once the mechanical system done, it's so much harder to change it than after the fact. And believe me, they will not like you if you come in and say, hey, you know what I said about this being a large enough area? Uh, it's not. They're going to cuss you out because they're going to have to change so many things because you just brought this up. So beware and bring that up to them as, much, as early as possible because it's going to drive PCB shape it's going to drive PCB mounting, especially if you have to bolt this board down to some sort of uh, thermal interface material and heat sink, or if you have to bolt it down to a case that's going to take your, your heat away. Uh, it's going to drive area cost, fans, layers. All these things are going to directly affect layout and also your mechanical design in a giant way. So if you can do it now, that's much better. Make sure you understand exactly what environment the product will be used in. And I guess I should go back just a second to this, uh, this thermal resistance thing, because once you know how to calculate that, uh, then you can do some neat stuff. For example, if you know that in 25 degrees C ambient air, your heat source has this thermal resistance to get to the air, uh, and your heat source ends up to be, let's say, 80 degrees Celsius. That means your product will work very well in 25 degrees C air. And you would think, well, I have to put it in, a, in an oven, right? I have to put it in an environmental chamber to find out how it will do at 80 degrees C ambient temperatures. Well, no, you don't. Actually, you can estimate, and it will be not exactly right, but it'll be close. If in 25 degrees C air, your MOSFET is at 
80 degrees, then in 50 degrees C air, your MOSFET is going to be 25 degrees hotter. So that's a nice thing about these equations, these really simple calculations. You can estimate heat uh, before you even put it into the thermal oven to do your environmental chamber testing. You know that if it's running 80 degrees C at 25 C, then you heat it up to 50 C, which is 25 degrees hotter ambient temperature, you're going to be roughly 25 degrees hotter at your heat source. So that's really nice to know. Um, yeah, so back to this. Make sure you understand exactly what environment the product will be used in, and if it'll be used with other heat generating things, especially if it's gonna be used in a rack mount container, especially if it's gonna be used in some enclosed area that will keep that heat in. Now, I say this stuff up front about um, mechanical design and things because I wish I would have taken into account this in the project that I had. I mean, I did, but it didn't delve into the details enough because I could have saved myself a lot of money if I had uh, used a few different techniques. And that's, that's why you want to look at this and estimate the heat first, do some simple calculations that I can show you and basically, you'll have a much better handle on things before it gets hairy. Practical thermal guidelines continued. Approximate heat generated, uh, approximate heat generated and choose materials. So figure out what's going to heat up. I mean, you know what that's going to be. It's going to be your MOSFETs. It's going to be your LDOs. Everything is going to have some level of heat loss. Decide if there's any cooler running semiconductors you can use, and if that makes sense financially. See what other IC packages are available that might spread the heat. I, I saved myself a lot of um, a lot of design margin. I got myself a lot more design margin by switching to larger MOSFETs. That saved me about, hmm, I'm going to say, 20 degrees. So it was nice to switch to the larger MOSFETs. Consider using more than one FET. Again, that's one great way to spread out the heat some more. So these are really interesting ways to talk about um, PCB heatsink. You can get about 4 watts if you don't use an extra heatsink. You can get about 4 watts uh, and still have pretty good operating characteristics. You can get rid of that 4 watts on the, heat, on the PCB for free. SMD heatsink. Now, if you get one of those nice little soldered down SMD heatsinks, you could probably get to about seven watts, probably without a fan, depending on the environment you're trying to operate in. Now, if you're doing like high power LEDs and things, then you're probably already on an aluminum PCB material. But uh, obviously, that's going to spread out the heat very well and it's going to do wonders but it's usually single layer only because you know your aluminum base is going to stop you from making any second layers so if you have a fan with your free pcb heat sinks you can get about eight watts a fan with an smd heat sink will get you about 10 watts uh, sheet metal heat sinks get you about 15 watts uh, assuming electrical isolation now i know i took apart a uh, I think it was a Cisco Ethernet switcher a couple years ago, and all, all sorts of thermal interface little rubber pads on the top of their switches, switch silicon, getting to their steel case. And I think that got them <clears throat> roughly 15 watts. Now, of course, it depends on your case and the size of that case. If you do an off-board heat sink and fan, you can get to really anything you want. Obviously, people do PCs with several hundred watts with their heat sinks. Note that that's only ambient temperature. It's not like they're going to be running these things in the desert. So uh, keep that in mind. Now, I would also just encourage everyone to use onboard temperature sensors as fail safes because if your board is getting hot, wouldn't it be nice to know? And temperature sensors are pretty cheap these days. If you are especially one of those people who can 
afford maybe a, an extra dollar on your design, you could put several heat sinks, I mean, uh, several board temperature sensors around and just keep track of uh, things, especially if you have a fan that could fail, then you can shut things down before things melt. And that may save you some money in the long run. So in summary, uh, thermal management is complex, kind of. You know, think of this early in the prototype if you can. Don't be afraid to spend a little more upfront for a better, better thermal solution. And uh, heat is proportional to area and wattage. If there's anything you take away from this class, it's that heat is proportional to area and wattage. Spread the heat however possible. Uh, someone brought up potting in the forum earlier. Potting is, is one way to spread the heat. Now, of course, there's about a thousand or 10,000 different potting materials, and some of them will actually isolate the heat. So that's a mixed bag there. <laughs> heat can be estimated using the thermal resistor method. Uh, PCBs can be used as almost free heat sinks. And that's, as we talked about, two ounce copper, wide thermal footprints. And there are a number of tools that can help. In uh, the half day, we're gonna talk more foundational stuff. We're gonna do a lot more heat resistance modeling. We are going to do uh, all these things and talk about things in, in more detail. So if you want to, you know, feel free to join our class in January. And uh, the other half of the day is Signal Integrity 101. So I don't know if you guys have been to PCB West. That's, that's drilled into you at every, <laughs> every possible class, but because it's, it's really key. But the nice thing is you understand these things. You make yourself a more valuable person, whether you're a PCB designer, whether you're an engineer, you're going to be much more valuable if you understand these foundational basics. So that's all I have. Um, feel free to type any questions now. And, you know, really, I'm going to answer questions on the forum uh, for several days. So feel free to put the questions on the forum if you don't have time now. But if you do want to ask a question, feel free to ask it right now. I hope that this class has been helpful to you. And uh, yeah, so ask a question. What are you dealing with? What are the problems that you face that you don't quite uh, understand and may need a little help with? We all need a little help sometimes. Um, I have hello. seen, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so thank you for the webinar. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, we went from one ounce copper to two ounce copper, as you just mentioned, on one of our projects. And uh, we had actually a lot more trouble uh, with with our assembly people. So uh, is there a way to balance uh, heat dissipation and how easily you can assemble uh, for reflow solder? And second question is uh, regarding the temperature sensor on board. Is there any routing guidelines, how close you can have those to FETs and how it affects and how it affects its uh, accuracy and what can we do about that? Some placement guidelines would be helpful. Sure. Yeah, that's great questions. Let me ask, uh, let me answer that last one first because it's easier. Um, I would say, you know, obviously closer is better, but if you can get it really close to the per that you're using as a heat sink, you know, even if you, you could even do like a, there, so let me go over briefly what kind of sensors there are. Any diode is a really nice temperature sensor, <laughs> unfortunately or fortunately, but there are things that are actually calibrated diodes that are, cal that are nice, really cheap temperature sensors. I think they run about 19 cents, maybe even less than that, but they assume you have an A to D channel free. So, you may or may not have that. If you don't have an A to D channel free, then you can get the I squared C type standalone heat sensors. Those usually run 50 cents to a dollar. And uh, those are super nice, but a little more on the expensive side. But I would run them as, as close as possible. If you can get them really within a centimeter, that would be best. If you can get them closer than that, that'd be even better. Got it. Thank any, you so much. Qu any question on that one? Oh, yeah, and that is very clear. 
Thank you. Good. So about the assembly part, what assembly issues were you dealing with uh, in terms of thermal management? So we were uh, so in uh, in the reflow soldering event, we were hitting uh, some of the components were failing, especially some ICs, and we had the top layer kind of oxidize when we are trying to increase temperature. Uh, uh, so our solder was not melting correctly and so forth. We mm. thought maybe okay. uh, because it, the same process worked with one ounce copper weld. So you had soldering issues and the solder wasn't uh, reliable to take away your heat? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a big deal. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of guidance out there on soldering issues, but one thing I would say on really small parts, this is something I had trouble with. I was using a two millimeter by two millimeter MOSFET, and we took some of those off the board, and they actually had no solder on some of the pads. And so watch out for that, because the really tiny pads, sometimes the solder sticks in those really tiny holes in the uh, solder mask. Uh, so I would recommend, if you have issues like that, to make sure your assembly shop has I think it's called LPI. Basically, it's it's inspection before the components are put on to make sure that there's solder on every pad. Were you using small components or not small components? Uh, no, we were using some uh, beefy MOSFETs as well. So hmm. we had almost similar issues uh, with, the, hmm. uh, with the soldering. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that could be yes. rough. I mean, soldering is a big deal. It, it has to be, it has to be clean. You have to use the right kind of flux. There's a lot involved with all that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I guess our with tones, the board kind of worked a little too well, and had some issues. Maybe I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that can be tricky. Anyway, thank you. Great. For Any other questions? Uh, yeah, no problem at all. Thanks for coming. I guess I have a question. Yeah. Um, so my group does a lot of custom LED boards and mm -hmm. I tend to design just like a roughly a two millimeter um, aluminum uh, back substrate on them um, okay. for metal clad. But we are running into instances where we might want to do better than that and I'm not sure if the best idea is just to make it thicker or if I should switch to copper which is more expensive and some places don't use that or um, yeah and especially with uh, there are technologies that allow you to have like multiple layers with the back still um, like metal cladded um, as well and I don't know if you have any mm -hmm. recommendations on that, because that can be really expensive. And yeah, yeah, I always try to find lower cost methods if possible. Some of those things can be so expensive. Uh, what I would recommend, well, so here's a question. Are you having trouble spreading the heat out or getting rid of the heat? That's a good question. Probably actually getting rid of the heat. So that would be probably- LEDs, Can someone hear me? talking uh-huh we can hear yep. you yeah i i think there's some board houses that allow you to step up the base plate material right to the thermal pad of the led instead of going through a dielectric layer where you have yeah where it's thermally conductive but not as conductive as separation the metal or something if i remember correctly yeah, yeah i think they, that would help too yeah, they plateau that base layer through the dielectric and your copper layer so that your base plate material directly can contact the LED thermal pad. So you're no longer you going through a layer. Then you'd have you'd have an electrical connection though, wouldn't you? Yeah, but the thermal pads are typically isolated from the anode and cathode of an LED. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that can work. So and it option. really depends on whether your system is having trouble spreading the heat because 
if it's spreading the heat already well, well enough, then you don't you don't really care how thick or what your base plate's made of. You need to get it get it outside into the air. So you know some sort of heat sink on your your aluminum plate is what you need. Whereas if it's if it's having trouble spreading the heat, then a thicker aluminum or a copper plate would work. Now copper is almost twice as good as aluminum in, for, in terms of how well it does spread the heat, but it's usually more than twice as expensive. Yep, cool, good points, thank you. So I had sure. a question. Um, yeah. Is there any, maybe um, kind of at the board level, is there any maybe quick, dirty, or easy to use temperature analysis software tools that you could recommend? You know, maybe that works with uh, uh, pads, a Siemens pads, or Altium designer um, board layout software. That's a good question. Uh, that might be a good question to ask Altium or or some of those, because I'm not aware of any thermal because they don't know how much heat you're putting in if you look into heat management software it's usually sometimes you can load your your uh, layout into those but i'm not yeah. aware of any pads or altium or anybody who actually does heat natively okay solidworks has a heat plugin and uh there's there's probably 10 other different software packages to my knowledge but they're fairly simple to use um yeah, I'm, I'm an electrical engineer, so the mechanical yeah. software stuff is a little tough for me. But I, yeah, I tried yeah, hyperlinks right. once for pads, but uh -huh. um, I mean, it was it was OK. But I think we're trying to migrate over to Altium. And I was just wondering if there was something you could recommend. But yeah, yeah I'll, I'll talk to of, Altium folks. Most of, the, most of the heat stuff is quite a bit different. It's a. But, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if someday Altium had it in there. They're trying to integrate everything else, which is great. Yeah, because it's nice because, you know, I don't know how well those higher, I what I call higher assembly type analysis tools, how well they can model a circuit board where a circuit board program knows exactly what's going on in the in the struct in the construction of the of the PCB. You know, could it help with better analysis? at the PCB level versus a full up assembly level. Yeah. But. And what you'll find, <clears throat> excuse me, I have something in my throat here. <clears throat> what you'll find is that software, <clears throat> excuse me, um, certain, it'll get roughly, kind of roughly good at understanding the heat pretty cheaply. But the more expensive ones will get a higher level of accuracy, but it's kind of a diminishing returns. So, um, yeah, so you're going to you're going to get I mean, it, it would be pretty easy and pretty cheap to put together software that does a rough estimation. But when you add in things like convection currents, that's when it gets expensive and complicated. Any other questions? Okay, it seems like we're going on questions. Uh, like Kevin said, he's going to be answering questions on our forum, Sierra Connect. I will send you the link. And I think we're done for today. Thank you very much, Kevin, for the presentation. It was really awesome. Thank you, everyone, for asking questions. And uh, Everyone have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.